All right. Sounds good, everybody. Should we get started? I see some good friends out there, and I'm happy to um, be in Melbourne. But of course, it's a little bit bittersweet, given that um, uh, some of us would ra rather actually be in Melbourne. But we'll we'll take this as as second best. Um, I'm actually in class at this time, and so um, my students were like, "No, Brad, just go. We can take it over." So I'm going to um, be on here for a little bit and and introduce um, the the beginning of the session. And, um, and then I'm gonna have to run, but I'm gonna try to come back. But we have left a lot of space for conversations and discussions about uh, what is critical community psychology? What is our definition? Um, how do we sometimes um, contribute to the, um, the power structures and the colonization of our settings and um, and other such deep questions about, about critical community psychology. But um, first you're gonna see some three really good examples. We're gonna have Erin um, talk about her work, um, some of which is connected to social reproduction theory. Um, we've got uh, Monica um, who does uh, work in Indonesia, trained in Australia and has really been um, talking about how critical community psychology has, has helped her see things through a different lens. And then we have um, Natalie, who's going uh, to um, surprise us on her new advances. We all gave, a, um, or, or several of us gave, gave a um, talk on critical community psychology at the Biennial. And, um, and Natalie has been further developing her work um, from there. And, um, and then we're up for discussion. But I did wanna tell everybody just um, uh, so you know, uh, there is a button um, if you hover your cursor at the bottom. Um, if you prefer to hear this, the translation in Spanish, um, then you would click down in that lower right-hand corner where it says interpretation and you see a, a little globe there, okay? So um, just to give a little bit of an overview, I mean, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, our title talks about revolution and we do kind of believe that, um, as community psychologists, if we're not gonna blame the victim, if we're gonna move beyond um, the community and really look at some of the, uh, the, the structures based on power, based on unjust authority and um, neoliberalism and, and capitalism and all kinds of other terms that we can use, um, we kind of need a certain type of, of praxis to do this. Um, and we are all for the two sides of community psychology. We love the strength-based, asset-based work with community members. And in reality, we never do uh, the activist work, the deconstruction, um, the critical community alone anyway. So we always need to use those tools of community psychology, the strength-based, asset-based ones, the sense of community. But we do feel like there are other um, powers out there. There are other um, structures that um, need to be questioned and need to be unpacked and need to be criticized and, um, and transformed. And that's what we mean. I mean, that's one possible definition of critical community psychology. And there's a group out there who's actually doing some work on, on trying to better define, um, Natalie, Natalie can maybe talk about that later, better define what is critical community psychology. But I think the key thing is, is this um, cyclical praxis that we are talking with community members, that we're studying policy, that we're utilizing, utilizing our theory to see things we wouldn't ordinarily see, that we're um, taking the data, um, having community members interpret it, um, identify what's wrong and putting that work into action. And it's that, you know, so the lessons learned that come from that and this, this iterative cycle of doing this work um, until we can really make progress and make some transformative change. Um, so uh, with that brief introduction, actually, I'm, I'm gonna say one more little bit. We're also working on a special issue on a theory called critical realism, which, you know, you can, the, the critical 
is important in both cases, but if we think about our, the typical traditional science that we've rejected, that's the positivist or post-positive positivist belief that if we just run enough experiments and we do this science, we're gonna find reality and truth and everything's gonna be all right. Um, that type of thinking was critiqued by the postmodernist or constructionists, um, uh, social constructivism, um, people saying that sometimes questioning, is there a reality? Um, uh, a lot of it is what is people's own interpretations. There's, you know, this belief in cultural or epistemological relativism. And critical, what critical realism tries to do is say, say um, we're not going to be naive about getting at the truth, but there are some actual truths out there, such as racism, such as these power-based structures that we feel like we need to fight, and we can assume they exist, and we can begin a revolution uh, to change them within ourselves through reflexivity and um, working to change policies and, and, uh, and in our own institutions and throughout the world. Um, so that said, I'm going to turn it over to Erin and um, have her tell us about her work. Okay, thanks, Brad. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Um, a little nervous. This is my first uh, virtual um, conference, although I feel like I'm on Zoom all the time. This feels different. Um, my name is Erin Ellison. Um, I am based in California, uh, and my work is based in California as well. Um, and I'm going to talk about how I use critical theory to deepen my understanding and my theorizing um, about empowerment. Um, and I think it's um, really wonderful to have these spaces because it's really important to think critically about our theories um, and to engage with, um, with lots of elements of our theories um, to enhance their power to, um, to do empirical research and to promote community change. And um, so supporting research and action through uh, like a deep engagement with um, theory, I think is really important. Um, and I kind of geek out about it a lot. And there's so many elements of this study and this presentation that I feel like I could go off on tangents on. Um, but uh, in this session, we said we would talk about kind of how um, theory and methodologies and transformation are kind of intertwined in our work. Um, and in this talk today, I'm going to focus more on the theory aspects of it, um, focusing on an idea about theoretical rigor um, more than anything, partially because we're trying to save lots of time for discussion. Um, so I'm going to try to be brief and I won't get into the actual empirical work that was informed by this uh, deep theoretical work, um, but I'm so happy to discuss it later. Um, I also wanna point out that uh, I started trying to do um, work on critical theory because I teach community psychology and I teach, um, I teach methodology classes and my students are often like, what is critical theory? I don't get it. And um, and they really challenge me, you know, like what, like what is the relationship between critical theory and these ideas of transformation? Um, and what is transformation? You know, they were asking these really amazing deep questions. I was like, oh, I really better get, get my act together. Um, so I was excited to get involved with um, a panel at the biennial um, and this, this uh, piece started out there um, and has really changed since then and included um, uh, a recently submitted publication um, or submitted for review for publication um, with my dissertation advisor, Regina Langhout. So I wanna recognize both my students and, um, and my mentor in the development of this work. Um, so get into it. So what is, critical theory. Um, there's some, some contested definitions. Um, one of the kind of um, 
shorthands that I've been introduced to is that if it's capitalized, it means it's coming from the, it's very specifically coming from the Frankfurt School. That includes folks um, like Marx, Freud, you may have heard of them. Um, and when it's not capitalized, it tends to be uh, a more sort of general definition that means that it's uh, about examining power, about thinking critically. Um, some of the definitions that have really resonated for me are about including a liberation approach, um, including an historical um, perspective to understanding power and access to resources, um, uh, definitions that require that we're challenging things like racism, patriarchy, um, and other forms of oppression. So, um, so therefore, the kind of critical theory that I gravitate towards is anti-capitalist to begin with. So that's very much the, in the Frankfurt School, um, but also anti-racist and anti or decolonial. Um, so in my in my presentation, I'm going to give you a little bit of both, but I just capitalized everything. Um, uh, so I'll introduce you in this talk to two critical theories that um, I use to uh, what I think um, I've done is uh, to advance empowerment theory within community psychology, or I hope to advance it, but it advanced my understanding of the theory and I, I hope that it provides um, some, uh, some fodder for discussion and maybe even future empirical examinations. So what do I mean by advancing theory? Um, I'm thinking that critical theory can really help us advance our community psych theories, lots of different theories, um, by deepening our theoretical rigor. Um, and I'll tell you about how we did this. And so just to kind of piece it all apart by, by uh, theory, I'm referring broadly to any configuration of interrelated ideas that are useful for understanding phenomena. Um, for example, empowerment would be one. Um, by rigor, I'm referring to knowledge production and um, having that knowledge production meet high standards that are appropriate for the given scientific paradigm. So in my case, I would situate, situate my work within the critical realism paradigm of research. Um, and so by theoretical rigor, I'm really referring to a process in which the interrelated ideas that are used to understand the phenomena are subject to a critical questioning of the underlying assumptions um, that are used in understanding and maybe even measuring um, those, uh, those phenomena and actively engaging in multiple ways of understanding those phenomena. And so what was really cool, and I could totally geek out about this critical reason, uh, realism bit for a long time if you want, um, what Brad was referring to uh, is a really cool paradigm um, where we've got some strengths from post-positivism or positivism and some strengths from um, uh, constructionism or constructivism. And so we've got this understand, this ontological understanding that truth exists. Um, it's out there, we can find it, uh, but the knowledge about that truth is mediated by the knower. So what that means is that we need situated knowledges. And so um, what I tried to do um, with empowerment theory is to bring in some other situated knowledges to enrich my understanding um, and the way that I went about measuring empowerment. And so um, the two um, theories, critical theories that I brought into my research um, and really inform the way I approach things um, were um, social reproduction theory, uh, which is a Marxist theory, and um, uh, and some um, uh, women of color um, feminist approaches. We call that BIPOC feminism, um, and um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but first. I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page about empowerment. Um, many of us are familiar with this key concept in community psychology. Um, and uh, the definitions that I like for empowerment include the collective process to change uh, unjust social systems, 
And what's super interesting to me about um, empowerment is the relational aspects of empowerment. Um, so the, the potential for relationships to build power is the thing that I'm really drawn to in empowerment. Um, and um, the relational empowerment literature already attends to um, the importance of relationships uh, to make socially just change. Um, but there was always something that a little bit, a little bit nagged me, like I was missing something when I was thinking about empowerment in these ways. And um, this was partially because I come from a background of community organizing and relationships are very central in that world. But also those relationships take a lot of work and through those relationships, we often see the exercise of inequitable power relationships. We see the reproduction of oppressions like um, racism and classism and so forth. I'm seeing there's a chat here. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, and so I, I was like, some something's missing. I need a little bit more. And so I really looked outside of um, community psych to inform how we can understand the kind of burnout that organizers face, the kinds of things that might um, sort of um, uh, impact our ability to make change. Um, and so uh, social reproduction theory was one of the sources that really helped me understand um, empowerment. Um, in my life as an organizer, um, I was a part of discussions that at first I didn't even realize it was theorizing, and Natalie will kind of probably get at that kind of theorizing as well. Um, but um, uh, this is just a little primer on social reproduction theory. I'll, I could talk more about it, but it's a Marxist feminist theory, and um, Marx alluded to the idea that we need to think about where the the, who produces the worker and what sustains the worker, right? But he, he kind of stopped there. He kind of just assumed that the worker already existed, right? Um, so this is the kind, these are the kinds of activities that, um, that support, um, support the generation of human life, um, both in the sort of um, uh, very practical sense, like literal reproduction, but also things like um, taking care of one another, uh, feeding people, um, taking care of relationships, right? These are the kinds of activities um, that reproduce um, the worker in the capitalist system. And it, this theory has been used to explain how oppression persists but in the, in the newer resurgence, especially um, of this theory, we're, we're talking more and more about how um, reproductive activity holds the seeds of the demise of the systems of oppression, especially capitalism. And so how people can take care of each other, um, also how they can withhold certain activities that reproduce the worker are elements of social reproduction theory. Um, and so this is rooted in materialism um, where material economic conditions impact all aspects of human life. And, um, and, uh, and so it's, it's one of these kinds of, um, it, it has some really nice alignments with empowerment in terms of the connections with resources. Um, but this is very much focused on those economic conditions. And one of the things I like to talk with my students about is that even if we got rid of capitalism, we, we would probably still have some other forms of oppression that we need to deal with. Um, and so I also looked towards scholarship um, from um, black and indigenous um, people of color feminists to also think through empowerment and that those kinds of activities that are labor in our empowerment processes. Um, and so um, th these are disparate literatures um, and um, we really wanna, we named it BIPOC feminisms to really center the locations from which this knowledge was created, right? If we're thinking about 
uh, different situated knowledges. This is um, this departs from a Marxist framework, although it also has some um, overlap. Um, and what's really wonderful about these uh, literatures is that it, intersectional theory really amplifies the lived experience of the intersecting oppressions. Um, and a lot of the work from this um, d disparate field um, provides a lot of thick description and focus on collaboration and coalition building. And so, um, you know, some, some really wonderful sources of um, knowledge about doing work together to make change come from folks like um, Audre Lorde and Cherry Moraga and the Combahee River Collective. Um, and so, um, so these kinds of ideas really sort of made me think more about relationships and how they take work and how we can consider that work as part of transformation because it's the work of solidarity and building power um, to make change. Um, so uh, I like to show this one to everyone. Um, they help me think more deeply about the challenges of empowerment as well as some of the potentials for transformation. So I won't get into the details of my study here, but it really interrogated how these kinds of reproductive activities, the labor involved in maintaining relationships, um, sometimes repairing relationships when oppression gets reproduced, like if somebody in an organizing setting says or does something that is um, hurtful to somebody else, especially when it you know, racist or classist or sexist or some combination. Um, so, uh, so I interrogated how that kind of labor was distributed within um, a social justice organization. Um, and, you know, in the end, what those theories helped me to do, aside from measure things differently, um, was to really think about and, um, and, and, uh, get into the idea that um, relational labor really needs to be shared and it needs to be recognized as an activity that is part of dismantling our um, systems of oppression. Um, and then, um, you know, moreover that, um, that critical theory and community psychology really requires an examination of our literatures, of the assumptions that we make about the different phenomena that we're um, examining and, and also considering what kinds of theorizing is happening on the ground with organizers in their locations. So um, with that, I am going to say thank you. I think we're waiting till the end for questions, right? And so um, at this point, I will stop my share and pass it off to Natalie. Uh, I think Monica is going next. Oops, Monica. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Erin. I think I'd like just to share one slide just to make sure that I'm on track with what I'm going to uh, share. Okay, has it come through all right, the slide? Good, thank you. Uh, Erin, I really like that quote about uh, everyone wants a revolution, but no one wants to do the dishes. And that's actually what I feel uh, I've been doing on a day-to-day basis uh, at the university where I work, like doing the dishes. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Monica. Uh, I'm joining this conference from uh, Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Uh, I work at the Faculty of Psychology, uh, Sanata Dharma uh, University. I think I like to start this conversation uh, by looking at critical community psychology as as a kind of avenue for um, for thinking about more contextual ethics, epistemologies, and methodologies, particularly from the Indonesian context where I'm based at. Uh, <clears throat> The main reflection that I would like to share is um, how using critical community psychology approaches has encouraged me to be more critical, first and foremost, with my own works as a scholar. Uh, it is through my engagement with um, critical community psychology that I gain 
for example, again, an awareness on the notion of reflexivity and how important it is to exercise this idea in our everyday uh, practices, uh, as it may help us to recognize and to surface how we may have a uh, how we might have unintentionally take part in perpetuating oppressive epistemologies and practices through the ways we do our scholarly work. Uh, while this kind of discussion might have been considered as something, I don't know, perhaps so yesterday uh, in the field of critical community psychology, but in the context of Indonesian psychology, uh, where the dominant phase of it is a kind of a socially and politically disconnected uh, type of psychology. Uh, it is not until I came across with this um, thing that in this discussion, we name it as critical community psychology, that I have exposure to all these uh, ideas about, about oppressive uh, epistemologies. For example, uh, early this year, I published uh, a paper which basically describes my confession of how through my study, I might have contributed in maintaining uh, prejudicial attitudes of inter-ethnic relations in the Indonesian context by approaching ethnicity as a kind of natural category with preset and fixed features, which determine people innate characteristics. And it is through references in critical community psychology that challenge this kind of understanding of ethnicity and cultural identities that I kind of gaining awareness on the problematic aspects of my previous ways of thinking. Uh, I particularly uh, gain such awareness through the notion like epistemological violence as proposed by Thomas Thieu and oppressive epistems as discussed in the literature about decoloniality movement in psychological studies. Uh, this literature has helped me to realize how in my previous studies of ethnicities, I failed to situate social identities as categories that are constructed in particular socio-historical and political contexts. Uh, instead, I assumed that uh, I assumed social identities as an in inherent category that has constant and uniform meanings, and therefore I ignored the historical and political forces which continuously shaped and reshaped the ways people give meaning to their ethnicity and how this notion of ethnicity has manifested in their life. So informed by critical community psychology literature, I learned how I was at risk of reproducing uh, stereotypical representations of the groups being studied uh, by neglecting the historical and political embeddedness of people's social identities. Um, it is through stereotypical representations that the practice of exclusion and discrimination are usually justified and normalized. Uh, so it is by gaining this kind of understanding that I became aware of the importance of uh, unpacking uh, my taken for granted assumption surrounding social identities as categories of difference. Instead of portraying the differences as neutral and natural categories, uh, I learned how I need to investigate uh, the process through which those categories are politically constructed to maintain a particular social hierarchy uh, that privilege uh, certain groups over uh, another. So it is through this kind of reflexivity that I become aware how, how critical community psychology has helped me uh, to have uh, a kind of broader understanding of what so-called ethical practices. Uh, previously, my understanding of conducting ethical research was more about how to make sure that the study is, is guided by ethically sound procedures. Uh, but critical community psychology has enabled me to realize 
that our ethical responsibilities as a researcher is not merely about the procedures uh, of the study, but perhaps uh, more importantly, is related uh, to the uh, so uh, social and political implications of uh, our, stu our study. So Natalie, I think I'd like to start briefly with that um, point of reflection and looking forward for our conversation. Over to you, Natalie. Thanks, Monica. And yeah, I will try to stay brief because we do want to have some time for uh, conversations today. Um, Monica, are you, um, can you stop sharing? Oh, there you go. I had a PowerPoint, but my computer is a very angry robot and it doesn't like to let me share my screen because my university owns my computer and I don't. Um, so I um, will not share it, but that is okay. I think that, um, you know, I'm going to try to weave in some narratives and then we can have a bit of a dialogue across our, our conversation. So when we first brought this panel together, I presented on one study in particular that focused on building a grassroots um, action oriented theory of transformation with organizers and activists in the Miami community. So shout out to Scott, my dissertation advisor on the call right now. Um, and, 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 you know, here I am a couple of years later, still kind of wrestling with the implications of the work that we did and trying to figure out how to make them meaningful. Because if the whole point was to make an actionable theory of transformation, then there should be some, you know, outputs of that work. But the inherent, the findings that we had that I'll briefly kind of touch on as I, I discuss some of the implications going forward are in and of, them, of themselves the reasons why we haven't been able to make a lot of um, momentum forward. Mainly that a lot of the action orientation that happens in our communities is so grounded in moments of crisis um, that we tend to be um, relatively ineffective and not have the capacity to actually do the work that we know will make social change happen in more sustainable and long-term long -term ways. So I, th I think where I just want to start is maybe highlighting that why the name of our, our presentation was around this idea of theory as revolution. And I think that the, the three of us and Brad, who hopefully will rejoin us for some of the dialogue, is that so much of the work that we want to be doing um, in community psychology really should be about revolutionary transformative change, right? We're not talking about transformative change um, you know, in individuals and in community psychology, though that is inherently wrapped up in how we think about transformation at community level, societal level. Um, but that really the hope is that theory is one of the tools in our toolkit for informing more revolutionary change, long-term sustainable change where we build and create and imagine different systems and structures in which we live together in, in community. Um, and, and, our work is not always focused on getting us there. Um, and so I'll just kind of unpack two of the studies that I've been working on just really briefly. But like Aaron said, I get very excited about the, the, the theoretical work that I've been doing and I am happy to come back to and talk about any of the kind of methods that informed the work or the, the analytical work that I did um, in community because it was a really interesting participatory theory development process. But I think I'm just gonna start with some of the, the findings so that I can talk about why I think it's informing a lot of the different practice components of my own work at the moment and speak to what Monica was talking about around this unintentional harm um, that we all um, need to be aware of or are aware of in different ways that recreates a lot of the systems of oppression that, that we're kind of working to tackle. So a lot of my work kind of started with me saying, can somebody give me an example of what transformation is? Um, and when I actually asked Isaac Poltensky that question, his answer was no, but I can tell you all of the things that aren't, right? Because it's so much easier for us to critique interventions or critique something and say, well, this is why that thing wasn't transformative, that it's really hard for us to figure out how our theory is informing our practice in a way that helps us move towards a more transformative potential of our work. So I started with constructing some framing, I, I went into the community psychology literature, more specifically the North American community psychology literature to see what it was we were doing, where, our, where the gaps were in that literature, where the opportunities were in that literature. And one of the things that came out of that process for me was a centering of the idea that process is an iterative kind of focus of the work, but we spend very little time writing about what our processes are in our work. What are the ways that we're building relationships? What are the ways that we're building our shared values, a vision, our problem frames, all of the things that are framing how we are going to go about solving problems. 
um, tend to take a back seat in, in the literature, right? It doesn't mean we're not doing them. It doesn't mean we're not engaging in these processes together, but we're not writing about it in a way that we can learn from each other. And so I'm really trying to figure out like, how are we engaging in these processes? What are the challenges that come up in terms of how we're building relationships? We just heard in the, if you were in the opening session, um, people talking about that kind of relational ethics, that relational component of our work. And I particularly loved how Peter King said, you know, just don't be weird or, or, or just out there being weird or something, right? Like just how do we engage as humans, as people um, in community rather than as academics? And I think one, that's not exactly what I'm trying to say, but how do we not be weird <laughs> so that we can just relate to people and build those connections through our work in a really authentic and genuine way? So then I took this framework that, that I had developed from, from the literature that talked about, you know, transformation is grounded in values, it's grounded in shared visions, it's grounded in problem framing, it's informed by long-term change processes. We have to look at multiple levels of analysis. The individual level is insufficient but necessary. Um, we need to, to be working with people who are most impacted by these different kind of perspectives like Aaron was talking about. We need to, to surface power structures or all of these different components of transformation. And I took them th this theory or this framework to my community partners who at the time were organizers and activists in Miami, working across um, different social movements, but collectively trying to work together. So they were representing farm workers, domestic workers, labor unions, climate justice, racial justice organizers. And we, we, we looked at the framework and, and, and they said, you know, this isn't really helpful in, in, in helping, it doesn't inform our work. What are we gonna, what are we supposed to do with this? So we engaged in a participatory process. We, we talked to other organizers. We really tried to tap into these organic grassroots theories that were informing their change practices. And that's the part I'm happy to talk about later because that was just such an interesting participatory process. But the two core findings that came out of that that I am now really working to imp implement into my own practice. Uh, the first one was people knew very well that the practices that they were engaging in were not gonna get them to their transformed future that they were imagining. No amount of doing more of what they were doing, whether that was organizing protests, um, you know, fighting for particular policy changes, none of those things were actually going to get them to this transformed future of a collective, unified community that is, you know, working towards healing and justice and, and equity. It was very transactional change, um, even though they had this very collective, radical vision of, of the kind of community they were trying to build. And so when we interrogated, why is that happening? Why is there this colossal effort and colossal amount of money going into you know, electoral politics and community organizing and policy change when everyone could just basically straight up tell me like, yeah, it might make some impact, but it's not actually getting us where we want to go, but I can't put it down because if I put it down, I will feel like I'm not doing anything. So it was this tension in organizers around, I have to do something, but I don't actually know how to engage in these practices in a way that's getting us towards that kind of sustained and transformed future. So when we really dug into the, why is that happening? We got to this idea, which is what my presentation is called on critical smallness. And it relates to so much of what these other two um, academics, Aaron and Monica were talking about tonight around relationality, prefiguring the, the kinds of communities we want to live in, that no amount of large scale transformation, sweeping policy change, electing a new president, you know, all of these large big things that feel like they're going to transform something have to go hand in hand with all of the small ways that we interact with each other, that we build relationships, that we learn from each other, that we listen to each other. And so we really mapped out some, some different kind of small ways that are deeply in, in, informing whether or not kind of larger scale transformation will have the impact that we, we think it should have in our communities. Um, and, you know, Aaron, you were talking about like the work of solidarity. I, and I had a lot of people in my dissertation talk about like the non-sexy work, just that background, door knocking, relational prefiguration of how we can relate to each other. And, and I'll just give maybe one, no, maybe when we come back to questions, I can, or I can give some kind of brief narratives. I said I was going to do narratives and then I got really excited about um, the project. But now I'm trying to think about what does this mean in terms of how I advise graduate students? What does this mean in terms of how I am, um, you know, a faculty member in a union at a, you know, institution that pretends to be progressive in a lot of ways? How do I do this? Um, 
as I build community collaborations? How do we engage in understanding the impacts of the small ways that we relate to each other? Um, because if you're not doing it in those places, then we could actually be unintentionally recreating harm um, for our students, our partners, our institutions. So I'm really trying to figure out how to use this work to redefine how we're thinking about small wins um, in community psychology, because to me that it's no longer about a small win in terms of the first step um, or in terms of, you know, sometimes small wins or this idea of, you know, having a win so that people feel re-energized and want to stay a part of a movement, but small wins in terms of all of the many pieces that need to happen um, together to build towards movements that, that aren't recreating harm, that movements where we can move towards more sustainable, transformed ch social change. Um, and maybe I will just stop there because I'm just kind of aware of the time and I want to make sure we hear from people. Um, and I'm not sure if Brad is back or if I'm, I think I'm supposed to be facilitating the questions at the beginning. So let me just pull that up. Before we actually dive, so we have three questions for you, but before we do that, does anyone have any questions for us, points of clarification, or just wanna jump in with any particular questions? I feel like my, I've joked about this before, but I don't think my facilitation techniques work on Zoom. I can't look into any of your eyes to, to, to see if you actually want to jump in. Okay, so I will kind of open with our first question then, which I think Monica really framed well, which is, can you reflect on or think about the question about how we as academics or scholar activists are unintentionally um, vulnerable to maintaining prejudice or, or the prejudicial systems that we are trying to untangle or, or, or work to disrupt. It, it seems that there is a uh, one participant using raising hand facility Natalie. Mm. No, oh, no, it's not. Well, in the second part of this question that might help frame it, frame it for you um, is, you know, how does critical CP, the way that Monica was talking about it, or critical realis realism, the way that Aaron and Brad were defining it, um, help keep us in check in that work? Or what are ways that you have used kind of a, a critical orientation or your own theoretical framework to, to, to check yourself in the work that, that you're doing? Is it okay to just jump in? Please do. Well, my name is Amber Christensen Fulmer. I'm from University of Alaska Anchorage here, um, and I'm the director of Native Student Services for uh, the university. Um, and I, I was the one who raised my hand on the chat because I, I didn't know <laughs> how you guys wanted to do it. But, you know, one, to your first question, you know, one of the things that I've been struggling with here uh, in the recent months is really having the discussion with my um, fellow faculty and administrators as to ownership versus allyship. And that, you know, just putting on cultural events during the designated month um, is not allyship that, you know, uh, and doing them wrong and just being like, oh, we'll get it better next year is not allyship, you know, um, and demanding that events take place so that people can show up and be seen is not allyship, um, you know, and so we struggle with that a lot up here. So I really wanted to, to tell you guys, <laughs> first of all, that I really appreciated hearing you talk about these things because we struggle with them a lot up here. I struggle with them in particular up here. Um, a lot of the ways that I, I do, I bridge it, I'm also an assistant professor. And so a lot of the ways I bridge this is uh, by saying no a lot 
um, to things that are expected a lot to committees, uh, you know, oh, you want me on a committee so that you can say you consulted with the director of native student services for statistics. Well, that's great because your statistics aren't good. And so, you know, uh, I don't want I don't want that. Um, and so I've I've really just started saying no and and working with people who do it right and who are being critical and who are um, being considerate of the things that all of you guys have talked about today. Um, and so I for I, I don't know that I have a better answer for you than that, but to say that I appreciate that. Um, and it really uh, does me my soul some good to hear that other people are doing this good work because it is really isolating. So I just thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Amber. I really appreciate you jumping in. And maybe I will just hint at another session as well, because Brad hinted at it at the beginning that um, and. Uh, Amber and, and 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 hopefully some some of the rest of you will be able to and want to join as we're launching a kind of critical community psychology global gathering process that hopefully if if funded will turn into a podcast series but we have a session on Friday to talk about that to really come together about how do we want to find and connect across some of the isolating geographical expanses that community psychology um, exists in. So Monica and I will be doing that um, with. Chris on and, and a few other lovely folks on Friday. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate that in terms of how do we as faculty, as staff, as graduate students, as practitioners push back against the expectations on us. Um, because I, for one, as a new faculty, feel like every day there are these little micro ways that I am being socialized into being the face of a faculty member rather than like an activist or someone who can relate to my students or whatever that might be. And, and so I've actually had conversations with my students about like, how do we keep each other grounded to ensure that we don't just get eaten up by the institutional system. Um, and I was telling Aaron, um, and I'd love maybe Aaron, if you could speak to it briefly, the paper um, that you wrote with Gina on kind of the team, the way that you developed your team in a way that is really mm -hmm. re like responsive to the things we're talking about tonight. Yeah, I can jump in here. I really love what Amber said. And um, in in parallel with what Natalie is also saying, like um, Amber's refusing. Amber's saying, no, I, no, I'm withholding this labor from you, right? This labor that like reproduces this inequality, I will withhold it. But like that also makes you vulnerable if you're not doing it with other people. So I'm so excited that you're doing that work. Um, Natalie to bring bring that all together. I appreciate it. Um, your question was about how we run our research teams, right? Um, so I was a student of uh, Gina Langhout at Santa Cruz for longer than I want to admit. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and one and we wrote a paper about how we try to organize our um, our research team space. And, you know, it's, we're not perfect. Um, I don't remember all the elements of that paper, but um, I do remember how we try to, um, try to organize our space because that's what I'm trying to do now with my students. Um, and so one of the things that um, we do is um, start off with check-ins every time. And it kind of acknowledges people are whole human beings. They've got a lot of things going on. And they're also trying to navigate an institution that may or may not be um, uh, very conducive to their existence within the, within the institution. You know, we have a, a lot of um, a lot of challenges in higher ed, and so we did a lot. We talked about lots of stuff <laughs> uh, in that space, like way beyond what you would think is academic related, but it really was also academic related. And I think this also relates to that reproductive activity and recognizing um, the challenges that being in um, uh, diverse groupings of people brings up when we're trying to, um, to achieve collective goals. So yeah, um, I don't know if that answers your question, Natalie, but uh, thank you, Scott, for, for um, pasting that um, citation in there. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that particular question? We had, um, I think our, one of our questions relates enough to the first one that I could say we have one more question that I'd love to, to kind of get in. Okay, so this is another question from Monica, which was, um, 
around the, the, the topic of the conference around solidarity is how do we navigate theories and theorizing, the process of theorizing as an enactment of solidarity. Um, you know, I think for me, I, I think for everyone on this panel and likely a lot of people in this room, um, that theorizing is a core part of our community practice, right? Theorizing that the process of engaging in knowledge creation and theory development drives how and with who and why we do a lot of what we do. So um, really want to put out this question of, you know, how do you navigate that theorizing process or theories um, as an, its own enactment of solidarity? I, um, I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Nepali. I think um, uh, what I learned is that um, to be able to reformulate questions that we are interested in, to investigate, to do study about, uh, I think uh, that's in itself is, is a kind of what you probably name as a as a small change, as a small steps that we need to uh, uh, to answer that all these uh, big large chains that we aiming for actually go hand in hand what we are actually doing on day-to-day uh, -day practices. And so um, also um, I re like just immediately feel connected, related to what Amber said about uh, uh, saying no is uh, often what we actually need uh, because uh, I think the this unintentional harm uh, from my reflection it sometimes happens through um, uh, because I don't have um, like um, critical awareness or a certain degree of suspicion to what I believe as a goodwill that drive, that motivates uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm doing. So uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, kind of a slippery slope to, to think, well, I don't, I don't it's, it's, it wasn't my intention to do that, but uh, well, unintentional harm is, is still harm anyway. And it's, and it's, um, uh get, getting that kind of understanding uh, it's it's not sometimes it's not a uh, short and quick process it needs a lot of a uh, confronting our own uh, I don't know assumption believed and something like that thanks Monica does anyone have any other thoughts? I think we, if I'm correct, I think we have two minutes left. Well, I do wish I was in a room with all of you because I feel like some of the best conversations usually happen as people trickle out. I'm not sure if we're allowed to stay here or if this Zoom line is going to be needed in a few minutes and our, our organizers can maybe let us know that. Um, Sorry, yes, we will have to shut the Zoom down, unfortunately. <laughs> well, hopefully we will be able to catch some of you in some social social sections. Scott, did you want to jump in there? I was just, yeah, saying the same thing. I, I appreciate the trickle out conversations and maybe there's some spaces here to do that. But I wanted to say thanks to the three of you for stimulating uh, material and, and trying to get some conversation going. Um, I know people are listening as I was with uh, you know, close ears, so thank you. Yeah, there's ne never enough time to have these conversations, but um, you know, Monica or Aaron, do you have any closing, closing thoughts before we run away? Just thanks everybody for being here and I appreciate the, um, the discussion and the interest and I hope we can keep it going. Thank you everyone, terima kasih. Yeah, I hope to see you all at the, the conference and um, if you have any questions, reach out to any of us and I'm sure that our panel will be continuing to have these conversations to, to do something with this as the intersections across this panel. So if you have any thoughts, we'd still love to hear from all of you. 
Thank you.